Church, it is so good to see each and every single one of you. We're so honored and grateful that you could join us this Sunday morning. Friends, family, uh, first timers, whether it's your 100th time here, we welcome you, we, we honor you, we thank you for being here. Um, and we love to see you, we love to see you. So we'd love to even connect with you afterward or next Sunday as well, get plugged into a small group. We love to connect with each and every single one of you. God is good, and all the time. God is good. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Josh. I am a, the youth pastor here at City Hill Church. Um, and, and thank you, thank you. I, I actually don't know how to react to that kind of stuff, so I appreciate it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, City, City Hill is home for me. I've been here for, I think, the last six years, um, five, five to six years, give or take a couple months probably, somewhere around there. And it's, it's been home ever since. Um, it really has been. Me, me and Philip, actually, we started coming to youth at the exact same time. That was, shout out, man. That was back when, uh, when Philip was in piano lessons every single Friday. So I would show up at, I mean, I would show up on time, or something like that. And, you know, he would be there like at 8.40, like the very end of the service, and I was like, just don't leave me alone. Like, we gotta be together. And praise God, we got together, we met people, and we're here today, so... It's, it's, it's been home, it's been a fun journey, but without further ado, um, we're gonna get into the word. And this morning, it's really gonna be a continuation of the last couple weeks, uh, maybe even the last month, and what Pastor Paul has been sharing in our vision of our church being a hospital, yeah. truly our church being a hospital to the region. And it's, it's something that's been on my heart, it's something that's been on the, on the youth's heart, it's to, to step out to do more than just sit in the chairs, to do more than just stay in the walls of the church, amen? So we're gonna get into it. Um, and before we do that, if we could all bow our heads in prayer, we're gonna pray, and Jesus, we welcome you into this place, we thank you. God, we thank you that you chose to be within each and every single one of us, and we honor you, and we love you, Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that you are in this place even right now, God. God, we welcome you, and God, I ask that you soften the hearts of your people this morning, Jesus. God, that you soften my heart, God, and let us all receive the word that you are bringing this morning. And Jesus, we glorify you, we lift your name, and we love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, and everyone said? Amen, amen, amen. amen. So yeah, I really believe this, this sermon, this Sunday morning, it's gonna be a continuation of what God has already been doing. And it seems like there's already been so many testimonies of what God has done, um, I mean, whether it be through the youth, whether it be through the church, through different friend groups just hanging out together, in, in those friend groups that have made it a point to be a hospital, those friends groups that have been open to what God wants to do within them. And it seems like in, through that obedience and through that opening of the door to what the Holy Spirit wants to do, there's been so many testimonies already. There's been people that have been, it, man, it was, it, was a, it was a really cool week. There was a, a girl in our youth, she texted me on, I think it was Tuesday, I forgot which day it was, but she texted me and she was like, hey Josh, I just met this guy at work and he essentially just told me that he's ready to take his life right here, right now, like he's ready to leave. And, and, she's, and what she's telling me, and, and I praise God for her, and I'm not gonna say her name out loud, but I praise God for her because she allowed the Lord to work through her. She allowed the Lord to mark her and for this man to open up to her. And she was open and she was ready to receive what God wanted to do. And she, and she wasn't sure how to, what to do. I, I wasn't even really sure what to do, to be honest. She wasn't sure what to do, but she told me, she's like, Josh, it's not, I can't, I can't leave that thought. It's not leaving me alone. It's just stuck on me. So she reached out to me and I'm like, I, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, it, it's one thing if someone opens up to me, but it's another thing if it's just, just a homie that, I mean, I don't even know him. He doesn't know me. He's from California. I don't know the guy, he's a truck driver. And you know, so I reach out to a couple friends and reach out to the team and, and the guy's like, I'm, I'm gonna call this guy, I'm really scared to call him, but I'll be honest, just like pray for me, support me, because I believe we are a hospital. And this is the 911 call to get the hospital room ready because the prodigal son is coming home. Because the son is coming home. So I gave him a call and I remember the, the call is ringing and I'm like, man, God, it'd be so much easier if he just didn't answer. Like, God, it would be so much easier if he, I don't know how to do this. And after, I think it was the third or the fourth ring, he, he answers. And my heart 
just, just starts going. It, it just picks up because now I have to, like I, I stepped out of the boat, but now I actually gotta walk on water. Like I gotta do something that I've never done before. And I'm like, Lord, like, please come and do what only you could do. And, and, I'm, and I'm talking to the brother and I'm like, hey, there's no real easy way or pretty way to present this to you, but an anonymous person reached out to me and said, you're ready to take your life and I'm here to tell you that you are not taking your life today. And he was like, yeah, that's me. I'm ready to take my life. And so we, we, we had a conversation for a little bit and, and he, kept, he kept repeating this phrase. He kept saying, listen, Josh, I really appreciate you calling me, but I don't wanna waste your time. Josh, I don't wanna waste your time. Josh, I don't wanna waste your time. And I was like, listen, man, I don't know you and I'm not here to, to, to bring a cliche of, uh, there is power in the phrase Jesus loves you, don't get me wrong. But I'm, I told him, I'm like, I'm not here just to bring these pretty things and leave you alone. Like, I am here for you, bro. I'm here for you. I know you don't, I know, you don't know me and I don't know you, but I'm here for you. And, and God wants you to stay here. There is a purpose for your life. So we had this conversation. And I wish I could tell you it ended with him giving his life to God right on the phone and all this stuff happening and him getting delivered over the phone or whatever it may be. It didn't end that way. But it did end in him realizing that there is a hospital in the Pacific Northwest, that there is a group of people that are willing to fight for him and take time out of their day to fight for him when no one else will. So church, that's what I want us to be. And that's what I'm gonna be speaking on today. It's getting out of the boat. It's getting out of the boat, being open to doing what God wants to do within you and through you, amen? amen. It may be uncomfortable, it may be inconvenient, but we are called to live a life that is fully surrendered, amen. fully surrendered. And I'm gonna be reading from Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, if we can get that on the screen. Um, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. And when he sent the people home, after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray, and night fell while he was there alone. In verse 24, meanwhile the disciples were in trouble far away from the land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water and when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified and in their fear, they cried out, it is a ghost, it is a ghost. And a little backstory on what's happening here, I, I'm sure we've all, almost all of us have heard the story of Jesus walking on the water. And if you haven't heard the story, there you go. That's what happened. Jesus is walking on the water. And a little backstory of what's happening. Right before this, Jesus was feeding the 5,000 people, the 5,000 men and then their women and their children. There was a creative miracle that the Lord did right before this. And right before that was a not so fun time. It's right when Jesus' best friend, John the Baptist, was beheaded. So I'm gonna try my best to paint this picture. I know the word of God could paint it way better than I can, so I encourage you to get into the word. But, but this is what it says, or essentially this is what was going on. John the, Bap John the Baptist gets beheaded. And after that, Jesus is, is sad, he's, he's mourning. If, if, if you don't mind, if you've lost a, one, a loved one, can you raise your hand? If, if you don't mind. It's not a fun picture to be in. It's not a fun situation to live in. And, and at least in my experience, when I lost people that were close to me, I didn't want to be with anyone. I wanted to be alone, I wanted to process, I wanted to cope, whatever it looks like for each of us individually. So Jesus and the disciples, they go into the wilderness because Jesus is hurting. And if, you, if you've read the Bible, you see that it's common that when Jesus is hurting, he goes to the mountain and spends time with the Lord, with his Father, that's what he does. So he goes into the wilderness, and what happens after that is somehow a group of 5,000 people plus their wives and kids found him going where they were, don't know how that happened, but they interrupted him. And if you've been interrupted in those moments where you don't wanna talk to anyone, at least I could speak on behalf of myself, I get pretty grouchy, I get pretty irritated maybe. I know when I was um, in 2020, when I was in school at home, my little sister would come and interrupt me all the time and I got very frustrated every single time. But what Jesus did was he had compassion for the people. Yeah. It's a note for each and every single one of us. In his moment of pain, he had compassion for someone. He was ready to deliver. He was ready to go. 
And so what happens? The people come, it's already nighttime, Jesus feeds the 5,000 plus, it's a crazy story, and then Jesus dismisses everyone, and they all go, and he tells his disciples to leave as well, and he says, I need to be by myself. And the disciples leave, and then what happens? There's a storm. They're in a boat together and there's a storm. And Jesus again, again, in a moment where he is alone and where he's, I don't wanna say Jesus was coping because I can't speak on behalf of Jesus, only he can, but in my situation, I would probably want to be coping and be left alone in that moment. And he sees the disciples struggling and fighting a storm, and in his compassion, again, he goes out for them. He goes for them yet again. So they were all in a boat together, and there were heavy waves, a storm arose, and Jesus left his alone time to come to the disciples and to help them. Are we all following? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, get out of the boat. <clears throat> We're gonna get out of the boat. In verse 27, we'll continue there. It says this, but Jesus spoke to them at once. Do not be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. And then Peter called to him, Lord, if it is really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And Jesus said, yes, come. So Peter w went over the side of the boat and he walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and he began to sink and he began to say, save me, Lord. He shouted, save me, Lord. And I want us to look at verse 30 here for a little, if we can, oh, perfect. If we can have verse 30, it says, but when he saw the strong wind and the waves, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I know that if they are in a storm, they already saw the strong wind and the waves. Peter and the disciples saw the strong wind and they saw the waves before he got out of the boat. He knew that, I mean, they were struggling. It was pretty windy that day. It was pretty wavy that day. And I'm like, God, what's going on here? How did he just now see this? Peter was a fisherman. He knows the sea. If anyone knows the ocean, it's Peter. He spends his life there, in a boat. But he always spent his time in the boat. Peter lived his life in the boat. It make, he's a fisherman, it makes sense. Usually if you're trying to fish in the ocean, you're in the boat, you're not swimming with the fish. It makes sense. He spent his time in the boat, catching fish. In verse 30 again, but when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and he began to sink. He saw the wind and the waves before he got out of the boat. He knew the magnitude and the intensity of the ocean. If anyone did, it's Peter. He knows how to operate a boat. He knows how to operate a vessel. But he chose to get out. He chose to get out. And why did he just now notice these things? Because this time, Instead of being in the ocean, in his boat, in safety, he decided to step out of his safety and walk toward Jesus. This time, instead of staying in the dry place, more or less, with his friends, really great friends, he decided to get out of the boat and come to Jesus. And he began to sink, why? Because it is a lot easier to observe from the safety of your boat than it is to be in the trouble of your walk. It is a lot easier to sit in the safety of your boat, boat than to step out and actually do something. We know the most successful people in the world are the ones that step out and do something. They're the ones that actually do something. If you have a dream of opening up a coffee shop, you open up a coffee shop. It's what you do. If you have a dream to travel the world, you travel the world. I'm not saying it's as easy as one plus two, but, and I understand there's a process to getting to that point, but the bottom line, if you want it, you're gonna get it. If you want it, you're gonna get it. So Peter stepped out of the boat because he saw Jesus, and he actually even told Jesus, if we look a little earlier, in verse 28, almost, almost, I'm gonna be careful in my words here, but almost challenging Jesus. Jesus, if it is really you, tell me to come walk on the water because I want to go. If it is really you, tell me to go because I'm ready to go. That's in verse 28. And Jesus said, come, and he comes out. And 
And when he got out, there's no more safety. There's no boat. There's just a storm and there's Jesus. And that's it. There's Peter, a storm, and Jesus. And if we go to verse 31, we're gonna end the chapter here. It says this. <clears throat> Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him and said, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped and the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. You have so little faith. It, it kind of seems like an aggressive statement. Like Jesus, he got out of the boat and he's walking on water. You have so little faith. Like God, then what kind of faith do I have? I mean, honestly. And I believe what Jesus is talking about here is you had the faith to get out. You had the faith to step out, but you didn't have the faith that I would provide for you. You didn't have the faith that the I am is in the room because he is. And friends, Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. And in this moment of trial, Peter was lacking of faith because he saw what was happening before him. He saw, he, he really saw, because it's a, lot, it's a lot easier to see from the stance of safety, but it's a lot more real when you're in the storm, quite literally, and you are walking on. I mean, that, that's pretty cool in itself, but when you're quite literally walking on the storm, and his foundation was found in the ocean that was quite like, that he was standing on instead of the king of kings, which is Jesus. And I believe what Jesus spoke to me in this moment is, Josh, in the middle of your storm, you don't need your man-made boat. All you need is me. Josh, in the middle of you stepping out, you don't need your skills and your skill set and your, and your confidence and your advancements. All you need is to step out and you need me. And that's it. And in, in, in the story I told at the beginning with, with, with the brother from California, at least he has a California area code, the guy I called, I didn't know. I didn't know what to do. I really didn't. But I stepped out and I said, God, I need you to show up. I need you to show up because I don't know how to walk on this water. I have never done it. All I know is who you are. And I trust you, Jesus. And I believe he's calling a, a, a believer or two or three or 400 in this place to believe in what he wants to do through your life. To believe, to believe, and to believe, and to step out, and not to look at quite literally where you're walking, but rather who you are walking to. And his name is Jesus. And his name is Jesus. And friends, that's for every single one of us in this place, including myself. Including myself. Turn to your neighbor and say, hospital. This is a hospital. So what separates a hospital employee from a patient? Luckily for me, my fiance is in the medical field, so I hear all about it. <laughs> it's great. And this is, here, here's a couple things that, that I was, that I, that I, or that the Lord brought to me or, or something, but here's a couple things that separate what a hospital employee does versus a hospital patient. Number one, a hospital employee is given a right to work. If you walk in the hospital and you just, just take a look at the nurses or the, or the these people or the sonographers or the those people or whatever other, whatever other titles there are in the hospital, you'll probably 97% of the time or 100%, correct me if I'm wrong, see a badge on them. They have the certification to be in this place at this time. Amen? They have the right to be where they are. They have the identification, the schooling, maybe the completion of a program, whatever it may be. But despite having that one thing in common, every single one of them, they're all different. Just like us. They are all different. Hospital employees have different specialties. You're not gonna ask a neurosurgeon to work on the heart because they're supposed to work on the brain. And you're not gonna ask a foot doctor to look at your eyes because they're not an eye doctor. Does that make sense? There is a specific purpose for your life. There is a specific calling in this hospital. 
And we can't leave the neurosurgeons away from the sonographers. We can't kick those out because these are better. We need all of them, every single one of them. Because there's gonna come a day where someone is struggling with cutting themselves and you might do a lot better job of ministering to that person than I can. And I'm not gonna doubt the fact that the Lord can still work through any single one of us and I, and I love that he chooses to partner with us but there is a specific call on your life, friend. There is a purpose for you being in this place this morning. Another difference, hospital employees have different securities and different insecurities. If you work with pediatrics or kids, you might not be as confident working with the adults. If you typically operate on newborns, it might be hard to operate on a 70-year-old male. Not that you can't, but it's just not that comfortable for you. Hospital employees have different levels of experience and they all have their different stories and they've all run into their, their crazy scenarios, whatever it may be. But all employees have been given the right to work here. All employees have been given a right, a badge, to be in this place. And just like when we look at the story in the book of Matthew, even though Peter was the one that stepped out, the rest of the disciples were in the boat. They were still in the boat ready to go. They were still there on guard and ready to move forward. This was their commonality. They were all together. And just like in a hospital, all the employees are together with their right to be in a hospital, church, I believe we are all together by the blood of Jesus. I believe we have been brought together by the blood of Jesus Christ and him himself, and only him. And it is Jesus that brought us together, it is Jesus that brings us together every single day, and it is Jesus that calls the brother and the sister to go forward to the other brother and to the other sister. And it is Jesus that despises gossip. And it is Jesus that despises pride. And it is Jesus that loves unity and loves it when the brothers and the sisters of Christ get along. And if we are gonna be a hospital, we must be together. We must be together, amen? Amen. Number two, a hospital worker doesn't just sit around and wait. Notice, a hospital worker is not reactive. If they're a good worker, correct me if I'm wrong, they're proactive. Meaning, someone enters into the hospital, they need help. They're not gonna say, oh, let me go make sure there's a bed in there. Let me go make sure, um, you know, like the common things like lights are in there and all, like let me make sure the power's running and everything. No, the room is ready to go. The room for the patient is ready to go. And there may be specific tools that need to be added to that room, but the room in general is ready to go. There is a place for every single patient that walks into that hospital. There is a place. There is a place. The room is prepped to the standard of how they were instructed before the patient comes there. When there is a 911 call, they know exactly what needs to be there. For the most part. Obviously, there are the special scenarios in the hospital. But they're ready to go. If you look at an ambulance driver, they don't wait for the call to drive. They're already driving around. An ambulance driver is driving around the city. Who, who here has seen an ambulance? Probably all of us. And you recognize that it is an ambulance. Who here has seen a believer walking around ready to help where help is needed? And who has recognized a believer and recognized that there is a call of God on their life? Because ambulance drivers don't wait to be called, they are driving already to be as close as possible when the call comes. Because I feel like, and myself included, first before anyone probably, we live a reactive lifestyle where we're waiting for someone to call for help. We're waiting for this, we're waiting for that. We're waiting to be called to the stage or we're waiting to be asked to greet. A hospital worker doesn't wait and if they do, they probably won't have a job for very long because a lot of people are gonna die and a lot of people are gonna slip through the cracks. And an ambulance driver does not know what kind of call they will receive. They don't know if they're fully equipped for it. 
They try to the best of their ability, but they recognize that there might be some things that are out of their hands and are only in the Lord's hands. There are some weaknesses within that ambulance driver, and they have to get back to the hospital. They have to get back to the hospital, and for that reason, the room has to be ready. They don't know if they will be able to save every person. They don't know what's coming at them, but they are ready to be there nonetheless, and they are bold. They are ready to be there. They are the bold ones. See, Peter lived his life in a boat. He didn't know what to expect or what it would feel like, but he knew that he needed to get out of the boat and do something. He saw Jesus coming to him and he knew he must get out. And he must get out of his boat. He must get out of his comfort zone and come to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Peter got out of the boat. Peter got out of the boat. Uh, Yelena, if you could come on the keys. I don't know where you are, but we're gonna stay here a little longer. Peter got out of the boat. If we can get verse 27 back on the screen. There's a couple really cool things here that happened. Jesus said, take courage, I am here. In the Greek, this is the same I am that comes from the book of Exodus when Moses saw the burning bush. It's the same I am to where Moses said, God, who should I say sent me? And he said, the I am sent you. The I am sent you. And friends, the I am is in this place today. The I am is in your heart today. The I am is with you wherever you go because the Holy Spirit is within you. And he is ready to send you. And when you come to someone and you say, hey, I see this in your life, who sent you? The I am sent me. It was Jesus that sent me. And he sent me for you because he is after your heart. It is Jesus that sent me. It is Jesus. It is the I am. Who is this God that is here for us? It is the same God that pulled the Israelites out of Egypt. It is the same God that brought the Israelites into the promised land. It is the same God that brought the promise of Jesus Christ. It is the same God, it is the same God that brought the wonders and the miracles in Egypt. It is the same God and he did it, why? To be with his people, to be with his people, to free his people. Do not fear for the I am is here. He brought you here for such a time as this. It is him, and that is your calling. It's to get out of the boat. It's to get out of the boat. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, for I am here. Another thing that happened in this story that was so cool to see as I was reading it. I don't know if you've been in this place, but I've definitely been in this place where you know that God is calling you to step out of the boat and you fail to step out of the boat. Has anyone been here before? I have definitely been here before. Where you know that there was a person that was needing healing on the street, but you decided not to pray for them because it's so much more comfortable in the boat. I've been there many, many, many times, far too many times. And it's, and sometimes it's even heartbreaking and demoralizing to see that the Peter that steps out of the boat and to see, I should have done that. I should have done that. And there's two things with this. This, uh, this text is from the Gospel of Matthew. To my, at least to the research that I did, this text also comes up in the Gospel of Mark and in John. I guess Luke wasn't there, so it makes sense that it didn't come up in the book of Luke, but Mark and John, it came up. But what's interesting in both accounts, in the Gospel of Mark and in the Gospel of John, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I saw. It highlights the point that Jesus was walking on water. That was a miracle. They've never seen anyone walk on water. 
Jesus was walking on water to them. They highlighted that Jesus was walking on water. But both those gospels failed to mention that Peter walked out to him, which was pretty interesting to me. And I'm sure Mark and John saw that, I mean, Peter's walking on water and he's sinking. It's not that they didn't see him. I'm sure they saw him. But it seems like Matthew was paying extra close attention when he saw Peter get out of the boat. And he decided to take note that Peter walked out of the boat. What about Matthew? And I'm not gonna put words in Matthew's mouth, but just kind of from the context clues I'm getting here, it seems like Matthew, out of all of the, out of all the other people, Mark and John, took a big look at Peter walking out of the boat. Maybe because he wanted to, but was too afraid to. It might be because he saw an opportunity, but wasn't sure if he should do it. So he described that Peter did it, and Peter did it, and Peter did it. Lastly, Peter encountered Jesus off the boat, amen? When Peter stepped out of the boat, he encountered the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He met him quite literally face to face. And even in in the midst of his sinking, in the midst of his trials, of his insecurities, and his lack of faith, Jesus still met him. But what I love about Jesus is he didn't get into the boat and scold the rest of them. It says he got back into the boat. In verse 32, and when he climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped and the disciples worshiped him. They, you really are the son of God, they exclaimed. And there was no shade from Jesus to the rest of the disciples. Why didn't you get out of the boat? There was no shame for failure. And what I love about Jesus is when Peter got out of the boat, he was there for him. And even though the disciples didn't get out of the boat, he was still there for them. And you see this across scripture. I mean, even with with Mary and Martha, if you know that story, it says that Mary chose the better thing. She chose intimacy with Jesus when Martha was, was busy working. But Jesus didn't scold Martha. He said, Mary simply chose the better thing. And if you look at even Caleb and Joshua, when they were sent as spies with the rest of the other 10, into Jericho to spy out what was happening there. And God said, this is your land. 10 people came back with the report of there is no way we can do this. There is no way. But there were two people that came back and said, there is a way because he made a way and he will make a way. And he has said that this land is ours. And church, there is safety in the boat and there is commonality in the boat and there is unity in this boat but there are some that are called to step out of the boat. There is a group of people, there is a church in this body of Christ, and I believe it is this church among others that are called to step out. They are called to step out and not to look back at the others that aren't, but to look forward and not to look at the situation that they step into, but to look forward at the one that called them. And his name is Jesus and his name is Jesus. And there are few that get out of the boat. There are few that see something and actually do something in this story. There was only one. But church, I believe the Lord is calling us to get out of the boat today. I believe the Lord is calling us to get out of the boat today. because there is safety in the boat. And it's okay to be in the boat. Again, they were all together in the boat. And Jesus came back into the boat and it was okay to be in the boat. But there is something so special about being a hospital worker that does something about it. There is something so special about seeing brokenness in the high schools of Auburn, in the high schools of Kent, in the high schools of Federal Way, and saying, God, I don't know how to do it, but I know that you have called us to shake this region. 
God, I don't know how to do it, but I know that you have called us to get out of the boat, and I trust that you will keep us afloat. I trust that you will keep us going in this. So church, if I could ask for us to stand, we're gonna get back into worship. We're gonna get back into worship. Church, there's a boat that I believe the Lord is calling us to step out of today. I believe there is a boat that is unifying us and and quite literally in this case is a church that is unifying us and bringing us together. But I believe that God is calling us to step out in faith today. I believe that God is calling us to step out, step out of the boat in faith today, to step out into what God has called us to do, to what God is calling you and, and, and asking for you to come out to do. And I don't know what that looks like for every single one of us. For some of us, it's loud and it's public, and for some of us, it is private, and that is okay. But I know that there is a calling in this place today to step out of the boat, to step out of the boat, to step out of the boat, to step out of the comfort, to step out of what we know to be home, to step out of where we spent our entire lives, to step out of our past, to step into the present, which is right here and right now with Jesus Christ. So church, we're, gonna, we're just gonna lift up a roar of prayer right now. We're gonna begin to pray and, I, and, I, and I, I compel you to get out of the boat right now. And Jesus, we welcome you in this place. We thank you, Jesus, for your presence. God, that you are among us. God, that you are with us. And God, I thank you for this call. God, this call of discomfort to get out of the boat, Jesus. God, and we say, Lord, we are coming. Lord, we are coming. Lord, we decide to get out of the boat right now, today, this morning. And we say, Jesus, come and do what only you could do in our lives. God, bring us people that need help. Bring us people, Jesus. Bring us to you, Jesus. God, we're getting out of the boat this morning. We're getting out of the boat, Jesus. We're getting out of the boat. No longer will we live in the comfort of our homes. No longer will we live in the comfort of our church and in the comfort of these walls and in our own personal comfort zones. God, we won't leave that forever, but Lord, we choose right now to step out. God, to step out of the boat and to step into what you want us to do, Jesus. God, speak to us. Speak to us, Jesus. Bring us scenarios, God, bring us people, open doors. Jesus, open doors. God, open doors, and we want to get out of the boat. Jesus, we choose to get out of the boat right now in the mighty name of Jesus.